first up, we have uh, Mike Parisio, forest entomologist with the uh, department uh, with Maine Forest Service, and he's going to give you a update on emerald ash borer. So take it away, Michael. All right. Good morning, everybody. Gary, can you give me a confirmation that you got my screen shared? I can see it just fine. All right, so yeah, I'll just start real quick with a, uh, a brief regulatory update uh, and the status of those boundaries here in Maine. So um, what I have up here on this slide is the latest iteration of those regulatory boundaries. So um, this isn't necessarily a very new change, but it is just happens to be the most recent change. So again, this happened um, uh, late in 2021. Um, but anyways, yeah, the most... Uh, startling addition to the, the southern EAB regulated areas, of course, that emergency area uh, in southern Oxford County. So that was obviously driven by detection and level. So um, what we've seen in the southern regulated zone um, and folks that are calling in from those municipalities, you know, we're obviously getting a lot of spread uh, within those areas. So you can see just that change from the left to the right map and all those new red uh, circles there. Those are all new um, um, detections. So obviously, you know, some natural spread going on within those regulatory areas. So um, we have been doing a lot of work uh, to kind of see if we have any um, detections that have breached this regulatory boundary. We have not been able to uh, to come up with any, you know, the closest thing going on right now. We have some activity in gray, which is kind of near that uh, regulated boundary border, but it does not extend beyond. So that's something we're keeping our eye on. Um, but for the foreseeable future, um, again, we're about to get into, you know, the, the heart of monitoring season here. We'll see what changes 2022 brings. But for the foreseeable future, you know, you can expect this, uh, these boundaries to remain the same until we have a new detection. Um, what we're kind of anticipating, obviously, is, you know, EAB expanding further into Oxford County. So Oxford uh, County might um, go countywide, you know, once we have some more detections outside of that emergency order area. And then, yeah, again, what happens when uh, we creep into Androscoggin and Sagadah County. So uh, we'll see when we get there. Those will likely be the next changes, obviously, you know, as as would be the natural uh, progression of things with natural spread there. So, um, yeah, that's the most recent addition. And I also want to remind folks calling in from, you know, this area, especially border uh, municipalities with New Hampshire, just remind everyone um, if you see something to, to let us know about it so we can follow up or have the rangers follow up on it. But, you know, all out of state firewood continues to be banned, you know, with very few exceptions. One exception to that is heat treated firewood. Um, that's certified and there's a couple agreements in place for some back and forth movement, but that's a very limited basis. So chances are if you're, you know, observing any, any, you know, visible firewood coming in over the New Hampshire border, it's, it's probably in violation of our regulatory rules. So yeah, please, please reach out and get in touch. Um, All right, so perhaps we also have some folks calling in from these northern municipalities. Again, this is on the same timeline as this uh, this change. Oops, why is that there? Um, sorry for that text. That's an inadvertent copy and paste. But anyways, you can see in that map on the right there, this is on the same time scale. These are the most recent additions to the uh, the northern regulated area. Fortunately, up there, spread has been a lot um you know, progress a lot less uh, less quickly as compared to the southern regulated zone. So this is holding pretty steady and hopefully this will continue to do so. Um, again, because of the EAB rules that regulate firewood as a whole, so all hardwood firewood, you know, again, cannot leave that northern regulated area. So this is something we've been dealing with, you know, stuff coming out of that regulated area and, and proceeding south, you know, mainly into places like Presque Isle and Caribou. So we have our eyes on this. But again, if you're up in this area and you see this happening regularly, please, uh, if you're willing, you know, let us know about it. Um, and yeah, that brings us into, you know, again, the requests as always for uh, for information from the municipalities and whoever else might be calling in as we, we approach EAB flight season um, from a regulatory standpoint and uh, a biological standpoint. So yeah, we're very interested in, again, documenting how that spread is proceeding uh, within these regulated areas already, just to see, you know, what the boundaries are looking like, if they're still relevant, or if we have any thing that's really infringing on those boundaries. And yeah, this is, again, one of the most useful 
detection tools here, you know, woodpecker activity. So if you saw this over the winter and remember the spot and you didn't call it in, let us know about it. But this might be something you're still seeing before we really get into uh, leaf on season. So again, if you see anything like this, regardless of your location, call it in. You know, we do get a lot of calls from areas we already know uh, uh, are infested and that's fine, you know, just to keep tabs on things, make sure we cover all our bases. Um, addition to that, so one of the things we're working on right now should be out hopefully, well, I would say definitely by the next time we all get together on this municipal meeting, but we're working on, you know, a more interactive user-friendly version of that uh, regulatory map, you know, for EAB, and there'll be some other invasive uh, species and pests on there as well. But as far as EAB is concerned, you know, that map that you're seeing regularly, we'll be able to update that in real time, basically. So you can keep a tab of that on your computer. And again, monitor where EAB is in proximity to your municipality or how it's spreading around your municipality. There might be some finer scale data uh, available there. So um, keep an eye out for that. Yeah, that'll be a, a nice addition, you know, for, for both sides of the equation here, keeping track of where EAB is. And that's a reference to the, uh, the pesticide quiz that you guys will be uh, required to take if you're looking for, uh, for pesticide applicator credits. So um again remember that out-of-state firewood is banned unless heat treated so that's all i have pretty pretty short and simple again we'll keep you updated if there's any major changes but uh for the time being that's that's what things are looking like going into the beginning of the, the 2022 monitoring season all right mike thanks a lot um anybody have any questions still got a couple of minutes here for mike's time can add them to the chat. Or you can unmic if you want to ask your question live. All right. Well, hearing none, I guess we'll move on to our next speaker is Jan Santier with the Project Canopy uh, Community Forestry Program at the Forest Service. And she's going to talk a little bit about survey opportunities and management considerations. Take it away, Jan. Thank you. Second here to share my screen. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, is that showing now in yep. the PowerPoint mode? OK. Um, well, for anybody that's on the call today that doesn't know who I am, um, Gary uh, said I'm the Project Canopy Coordinator. Um, and for those who don't know what Project Canopy it is, it's the state's urban and community forestry program. And we assist cities and towns, schools, nonprofits, um, educational institution with technical assistance, as well as with grants um, to help guide management of urban and community tree and forest resources. So kind of a one stop shop for those towns on the call that that are interested in um, establishing a maintenance regime for managing EAB. Um, so some of the, the resources that we have available, we've got a lot of stuff online. Uh, I think probably most of you are familiar with the dash, uh, you know, the, the current um, site that we have set up and um, with some sample plans and, and guides. Um, and it's our intent to, to um, get a lot more information available on there. We've had a lot of communities within Maine that have now established some management plans and um, as well as things like um, uh, bid specifications for going out to uh, treat ash. And uh, all of that information is going to be available um, for you to be able to access um, in the future. And again, I just always highlight grants. Um, we just did a round of grants for 2022, but we did not use up all the funds. So we're going to do another round of grants. And um, one of the specific activities that we're going to fund uh, in this second round of grants will be more management planning, more um, uh, capacity to do inventory for EAB management, um, as well as, as replanting and maintenance. Um, and then I just also want to mention that 
um, with technical assistance. We do have interns, we do have capacity within the main forest service. If you don't want to go the route of a grant, but you do want to do an inventory, maybe you want to do some, some training locally, we have the ability to do that training with you and work with volunteers to do the inventory work um, and, and to come up with something um, a little bit more organically. So if you're interested in any of those things, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and we can uh, get you in the queue to get something going. Um, so uh, again, I, I hit on this every single time, but the, the single most important thing that you can do at the community level is to conduct an inventory. And that's an inventory of your trees as well as your community assets, volunteer groups, tree related policies, what your staffing capacity is, um, taking a look at who your consulting arborists are, um, uh, you know, within your um, area of, of, of work, pesticide applicators, etc. Conducting that inventory is critical. You cannot manage anything that you do not what you know what you have already. Um, and then to develop a timeline for management based on that inventory. And to ask yourself some very basic questions about um, whether or not you're going to preserve the ash trees, whether you're going to do any treatment, you're going to remove them all. Um, how infested wood will be dealt with, etc. Um, but more of the focus um, here on this call today uh, is talking about public involvement. Um, you know, we uh, do hear from people that are interested within your communities that might come directly to us, but you have a much better tap on, on who the volunteers are and who the, the groups of volunteers are that might be interested in helping us to um, educate for one, um, to do some of that public education so more people know what EAB is and what the, the risk is of um, not doing anything, as well as to help us with monitoring efforts. Um, so uh, I am managing one component of our monitoring efforts, and that's these uh, green funnel traps that pictured here right in um, this tree. Whoop, didn't mean to do that. Um, so these green funnel traps have to be uh, maintained by somebody locally. Um, typically, they, the insects that are collected um, should be sampled every week to at a maximum of, of once every two weeks. So we need somebody on the ground to, to help do this maintenance for us. We can't um, uh, manage to, to do all those collections if we were to put out a lot of these traps. And we have about 50 of them available. And I've got those areas on the um, slide circled where we want to concentrate getting these, these green funnel traps out. They've been very useful to us in, in helping to determine where uh, EAB has expanded to particularly in Oxford County, but the more monitors I have in these, these yellow areas, particularly on the edge of the quarantine, as well as um, within the quarantine in these, these orange areas where we haven't yet detected EAB in those communities, those are all also very um, helpful for us to determine where EAB is. And that's both in the north and the south, although um, as Mike alluded to, you know, it is expanding more rapidly in the south and we are um, somewhat um, focusing more of our efforts on that particular area. But for any monitors that want to get involved, they again can get, reach out to me um, and myself, Kim Ballard, who is our outreach coordinator. And then we're going to have a couple of interns, too, that are working with the Forest Health Lab that are going to help us with um, getting those deployed in uh, June. So let us know. So again, communities, what you need to do um, is inventory, um, develop a plan, um, and you know communicate those plans with us. So that's really all I have today. Um, I definitely didn't need 15 minutes on the schedule, but thank you guys for your time. I know a lot of you are here for uh, hearing about what's going on with oak trees anyway, so. All right. Well, thank you, Jan. Anybody have any quick questions for Jan? We've got plenty of time. You can either raise your hand using the reactions button or 
you can unmute if you want to, if you've got a, a quick question. All right, well, hearing none. Looks like our next speaker is Tom Schmelk, a forest entomologist, and he's going to talk about- I have about a question. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Hi, this is Kim Bark Smith from Old Orchard Beach. Hi, Jan. How are you? I'm um, great. Long time no see. <laughs> <laughs> um, when we talk about inventory of trees, are we talking about all the trees? So we're talking about, because we're getting attacked from all these different directions. It seems like my life is now spent dealing with these uh, infestations. Yeah. So, uh, whatever you your you know desire is, um, absolutely, our grants support full inventory of all public trees. Um, but if you want to just focus on ash, that is something that you can do as well. But um, as far as management goes, knowing what you have um, as your complete tree resource is extraordinarily uh, valuable and something that we will support. Well, the uh, the attack on the hemlocks right now is scaring everybody down here, especially when you look at what happened to the state park. So um, that's a big concern, too. Noted. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you as well. Uh, any other quick questions? I don't see anything in the chat. If you have access to that, you can always add a question to the chat as well. All right, so I guess I'll turn it over to Tom Schmelk. He's going to talk a little bit about hardwood defoliators and brown tail moths, spongy moth, and winter moth. Take it away, Tom. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, so we'll just jump right into it. Maybe. Okay, so first up is winter moth. Um, for those of you not familiar with winter moth, it is a, a non native moth uh, native to Europe. Um, does play a pretty important ecological role over in Europe. It's usually one of the first caterpillars available to migratory birds. Um, we do see s some limited control of, uh, of birds consuming the caterpillars over here. Uh, so the males are fully winged, um, capable of flight. Uh, the females are apterous or wingless um, and need to crawl up the trunk of a tree in order to be able to deposit her eggs on the, the bud tips. Uh, but the reason why we're talking about it now is the caterpillars are um, hatching out and they'll be feeding uh, basically now through the end of May. Um, and this is sort of a, the damage. They create sort of a shot, uh, shot hole damage um, on maple and oak. Uh, they also have other hosts, but these are uh, the two of concern for us here. Um, they also feed on blueberry and some, some other hosts, like I mentioned. Okay, so we did have um, a few hot spots of winter moth in Maine, um, and it's sort of typical of Maine, even in areas where we have released biocontrol and we have had good control of them in the past. Um, sometimes they escape and sort of pop up again. So the three hot spots for last year were Kittery down here, where one of our first release sites was, and I'll I'll talk about biocontrol in the next slide. Um, down here in the um, Harpswell, Phippsburg, um, Boothay area was also another big hot spot. Um, and then up on MDI, um, specifically uh, North Northeast Harbor, um, we had a, a huge trap catch. Um, we did have a very reduced trap catch uh, program last year, um, and that's collection for the adult males um, that we do in uh, early December. December basically through the end of January. Um, usually we put out about 65 or 70 traps and this year uh, we only had about 20 um, just due to some logistical errors. Um, but we also were collaborating with UMass Amherst and on some of their research and um, they were kind enough to to give us some traps um, to help cooperate in that. Uh, so we do have an effective biocontrol for winter moth. It's a parasitic fly called Cyzenus albicans, and we've been doing releases in Maine since 2013. Um, huge, huge success in most of uh, southern New England. In fact, it's been so successful that we've been having trouble um, getting enough flies to, to release at new sites. Um, 
down in Massachusetts and um, other parts of southern New England, um, this fly has dropped winter moth populations um, almost to non-detectable levels in, in many places. Although in Rhode Island, uh, we heard that they are experiencing a, a boom, and that's, again, pretty typical of winter moth. Even in areas where you have had uh, the biocontrol released and established, sometimes it does pop up and, and sort of escape its natural en enemies for that year. Um, our newest release site is in South Bristol, and we will be releasing those flies probably next week. Um, I'm actually, after this meeting, going to go down and uh, check on the emergence cage um, and, and hopefully uh, start a new, uh, a new release site down there. So this graph here kind of tells the story of the biocontrol release program. So at the beginning, um, we used to get a, you know, a few thousand flies to release. Um, and then over the years, uh, since we used to get a lot from uh, Massachusetts that were sent up here for new release sites, we've had to basically rely on just our previous release sites uh, here in Maine and Although we spend many man hours collecting uh, the infected caterpillars at some of our previous release sites, um, the numbers just aren't there. And we've been getting, um, you know, under 500 uh, for the past few years compared to, you know, the thousands that we would get before. Um, but we are in the trying to to come up with um, ways to get more biocontrol, and um, me and Allison are are exploring that currently. Uh, so this is just a reminder, uh, you know, it's spring, many plant sales going on. Um, so the key message here is to not move um, plant material with attached so soil June through November. That's when the pupa are in the soil. Um, they are, look just like a little dirt clod, very, very hard to um, distinguish. And that's the way that winter moth came to Maine is by um, or at least we're almost positive that it came by um, plant material that had the associated soil and pupa with it from out of state. Um, so if you have these plant sales going on in your community, have them earlier in May than later in May. Um, typically about the last week of May is sort of the start of that um, danger in the soil time period. Uh, so now on to everybody's favorite human health nuisance. Um, sometimes uh, when I give towns uh, or talks to towns, they are very creative in the advertising sometimes. And this is from um, uh, a talk that I gave in, in Camden a couple of years ago. So the most current situation with brown tail, um, based on last year and um, our winter web surveys uh, this past winter. Uh, the most heavily impacted um, counties in Maine are Androscoggin, and Kennebec, Knox, and Waldo, which all uh, happen to be some of the most populated counties in Maine, unfortunately. Um, so last summer, we, we have about 10 monitoring sites throughout the infested area in Maine, um, and we monitor those for weekly for development. And we relay that on our web page um, and through social media, just to keep our stakeholders and towns and the public uh, aware of what Brown Tail is doing. Um, so these monitoring, these developmental monitoring sites also sort of double for disease monitoring. And last year we did find uh, pathogen activity at a lot of our monitoring sites um, as far north as Blue Hill and they were pretty the pathogen activity was pretty widespread on a region scale but locally very um very condensed to maybe uh, a single apple tree or single cherry tree on the side of the road and you drive down the road and uh, brown toe is doing just fine uh, but this is sort of a, a there's a silver lining in that and if we continue to get this uh rainy weather that we've been getting uh, pretty reliably uh, through the month of April, if that continues into May and June, uh, these populations of, of pathogen activity are in a good location. So um, it, it would be a good recipe for a uh, region-wide population collapse, although at the level that brown tail is in the state, it might take a couple of years in a row, um, but I'm ever hopeful for a single, a single year population collapse. 
Um, so we also had the first reports of emergence uh, from these overwintering caterpillars um, the week of April 11th. Uh, we had one report and then the following week uh, we had a few other reports that came in and also confirmed last week um, that the that brown tail was out at most of our sites. So uh, aerial survey. Uh, so each each year we do two rounds of aerial survey, one in the late spring, early summer to pick up the actual defoliation from the caterpillars consuming the leaves. Um, and then we do another round of aerial survey in the late summer, early fall to pick up the um, the damage from the young caterpillars called skeletonization. Uh, so both those flights combined last year, uh, we totaled almost 200,000 acres. Um, that's up quite a bit from even the year before that, uh, which was 153,000 acres. Um, and we have seen increased activity around the Lewis and Auburn area. Um, China Lake and then South uh, uh, Lake Hobsey in Manchester, um, but many, many other regions, uh, regions of Maine are still um, experiencing high, high brown tail populations. So, so this is the, the map that we have, and on this map, we have the aerial survey data on there, as well as our winter web survey. Um, and this winter web survey is conducted typically from January until March, uh, till the end of March. And what we're doing is our, our crews, our field crews are basically driving the major roads throughout the infested areas, and then also sort of a buffer on the outside to capture population expansion or satellite populations. And what these dots represent is the number of webs per tree um, that, we, that we estimate on a given stretch of road. Um, so the hotter the color, um, obviously, the hotter or the the higher the number of brown tail there are um, per you know per tree in a given stretch of road. You can see um, down here in the Lewis and Auburn area, um, there's quite a bit of red dots. And then also of note, um, down here in Cornish and Limerick, um, even though the numbers are low, they're awfully close to that New Hampshire border. Um, so we might see it spill over into New Hampshire this year. Um, but we are keeping close contact with our colleagues over um, across the border there. And I should note that uh, all of this um, data, these maps, um, as well as the. Is basically, so basically all the survey data is available uh, via map or we have a interactive dashboard um, on our website. And if you haven't checked out the website um, recently, definitely check it out. Lots of revisions, lots of shuffling um, that has gone on. Um, it's definitely uh, a useful tool. Uh, so, just a graphical depiction to put into your minds what's been going on with brown tail um, the past couple of decades. You can see the last um, major outbreak that we had. You know, was <laughs> was maybe you know five to seven thousand acres of damage compared to last year where we had almost 200,000 acres of defoliation. So this out current outbreak, which started in 2015 or started building in 2010, um, it's it's quite an order of magnitude worse than we've seen it in the past few decades. Um, and it's certainly getting to be on par with what Brown Tail was when it first um, got established in Maine and um, and in New England in general. So hopefully the rain holds out and, and we have a population collapse um, because the alternative is, is not super great. <laughs> okay, um, so just to make everybody aware, uh, formerly spongy moth, formerly known as gypsy moth, um, there was a, a common name change um, just to be a little less derogatory. Um, but spongy moth is the, the new common name for gypsy moth. Um, lot, lots of confusion, especially uh, in midsummer, uh, about the difference between spongy moth and brown tail. You can see they look fairly uh, different than brown tail. They are in the same family, um, but brown tail has those two orange dots towards the end, and then it, it will have white tufts on each body segment, um, looking pretty completely different from spongy moth. 
Okay, so uh, the outlook for 2022 on uh, for spongy moth. So last year we had about 55,000 acres of defoliation or damage along the New Hampshire border, and that's sort of spillover from that New Hampshire population. Um, so within, sorry, so we had 30,000 acres of defoliation in Maine, and that's spillover from a 55,000 acre plot um, over in New Hampshire. So much of New England is sort of experiencing uh, a population boom for gypsy moth. Last year, driving on the New Hampshire, Massachusetts border, looking up at the hills, sort of looked really gray and, and dingy, and that was um, all spongy moth defoliation. Uh, so like brown tail, like I said, uh, they're, in, they're closely related, they're in the same family. Um, spongy moth also has its, um, its pathogens. It's, uh, it has a fungus and a virus um, pretty closely related to the fungus and the virus that attack brown tail. Um, so if we do have precipitation uh, in May and June, you know, likely that's that's going to spell um, hopefully disaster for spongy moth, but fingers crossed on that one. Um, as far as other areas in Maine that have uh, spongy moth damage um, around the Millinocket area, um, we're probably going to have some sort of outbreak um, and we've seen increased cap trap catches of uh, the adult males in spruce budworm uh, traps so it's sort of a, a warning that we're likely to see uh, a population expansion in that area of Maine um, and there are likely other areas that will be blowing up I know last year at some of my brown tail monitoring sites um, there were uh, it was sort of a, a co-defoliation with gypsy moth and in Turner. I saw the largest uh, largest spongy moth caterpillars that I've seen in in quite some time, uh, very well fed. And again, uh, just to you know hit on some of the life stages of spongy moth, um, these are the adult females uh, laying these egg masses, and that's one of the reasons why they chose, um, or that's the reason why they chose uh, spongy moth as a new common name because of the egg masses. Um, these are the young caterpillars uh, hatching out from their uh, egg mass, and then these are the larger mature caterpillars that, again, are often confused for for brown tail. There was a few people uh, last year that called and were very insistent. Um, in the Freiburg area that they had brown tail uh, moth. And it's sort of a timing thing, but I also asked for pictures and, and was able to determine that, uh, yes, it was spongy moth. And then last, this is sort of a reminder um, for the poll questions that, or the poll quiz that's uh, gonna be required if you want uh, applicator credits. Um, just Just a heads up, but we did talk about those. But that'll end it for me. All right. Thank you, Tom. So there was one question in the chat that I think that Allison has answered, but there was a question about why some areas that were heavily infested with brown tail moth in the past, like in Cumberland County, and some of those areas weren't as heavily infested this past year. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we did have a, a population collapse in 2019 um, due to the, the fungus and the virus and the cool wet conditions we had back then. There are some areas um, within that mid-coast region that are definitely still experiencing some of the benefits from that. Um, I could tell you in Dresden and Richmond, uh, where I live, um, we are still seeing the benefits of that collapse in 2019, and for some reason they have not uh, filled back in. And it's definitely the case, even a little bit down coast um, in some of those areas that were mentioned. Um, it definitely has filled in, in some areas, but um, some areas have continued to escape. Um, I always joke that Browntown knows that I live in that area and, and decides to, to go elsewhere. All right, other questions for Tom? Everybody's already an expert on all these things. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> so just as a reminder, another reason not to move firewood around is also the spongy moth. 
And that one is easily moved around with its egg masses on firewood. And if you bare root the plants that you're going to sell at plant sales, that helps to reduce all kinds of potential movement of invasives. And ideally, that's what we'd like people to do if they can, is if they're going to share plants, is to wash all the native soil off the roots and then repot them in clean potting material and, and do it that way as opposed to moving soil around. And Allison has posted in the chat that the weekly updates on brown tail moth will be shared through the new Gov Delivery Brown Tail Moth Update Bulletin. And there's a, a link that you can subscribe at on, on the chat, which is main.gov slash DACF slash knockout BTM. And with that, we'll, unless anybody else has another quick question, give you a second. All right, so our next speaker is Aaron Bergdahl, who is the forest pathologist for the Maine Forest Service. And he's going to talk about oak wilt and lookalikes, as well as beech leaf disease and maybe some other disease updates. So, Aaron, are you ready to go? I see beech leaf disease. Wish I wasn't seeing beech leaf disease. <laughs> you need to unmute, Aaron. We're not hearing you. I'm sorry about that. I thought I was already unmuted. Um, no, that's okay. Yeah, so we're gonna be start. We're gonna start talking about beech leaf disease, and then we'll we'll move on to oak wilt, and uh, I'll address any questions that people have. So beech leaf disease is a new new issue with that that we're dealing with here in Maine. Oops. Um, uh, beech leaf disease was first found in Ohio in 2012. It was confirmed in uh, May 2021 in Lincolnville. Uh, Maine, uh, the closest previous known location was Massachusetts, so it took a pretty significant jump. Um, beech leaf disease can kill both American and European uh, species of beech. It also impacts uh, Asian beaches, so pretty much any beach is impacted uh, negatively by beech leaf disease. Um, as of uh, December 2021, okay, I that I could say as of today, beech leaf disease is found in 109 U.S. counties and 11 Canadian uh, counties as well. Here's a closer closer view of where beech leaf disease is currently found. And you can see by the color coding here that, you know, until 2018, this is really a, a Western Pennsylvania, you know, on the shores of Lake Erie and just a, a short time uh, detections have been made, especially in 2020 and 2021 in Connecticut, uh, Massachusetts, and, and now um, up here in Maine. Uh, this is where uh, beach, this is a, a basal area map of beach in Maine. So there's a lot of beach in Maine, and therefore there's a lot of uh, potential susceptible uh, species um, that could be impacted. And you know, most of the the beach in our state is also impacted by beach bark disease, which is a an, another a whole another disease. Um, and the implications of beach leaf disease are bad enough, but um, you know, when you combine that with the already stressed trees from beach bark disease. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Uh, we did do uh, a lot of survey following the detection and not all of the, the sites are represented here because there's a very high concentration in the Knox and Waldo uh, County areas. Um, but you can see the furthest north goes up to Penobscot uh, Research Forest in Penobscot County and furthest west is just on the just over the border in Lincoln County. Um, and we haven't really gotten over to Hancock uh, that much to survey yet, but uh, that's uh, we anticipate doing that a lot more this next year, and I fully intend to find it um, in, in Hancock County. Uh, I, I've gotten some somewhat reliable reports that people have seen it, and I'm gonna you know check check on those areas here this uh, as soon as symptoms are are visible and uh, try to better inform this map. So symptoms of beech leaf disease are, they're pretty clear. Um, the first one is banding of leaves. The symptoms are mostly seen are most easily seen by looking up from the from underneath the canopy. So when you're in a beech forest and you look up into the canopy, you can see these very distinct dark bands in between the veins. 
Uh, so it's not a it's a it's a fairly you know uniform pattern. Not all leaves are impacted, so you can see uh, from these pictures that you know there are some healthy leaves in a, in and amongst the the impacted leaves. Um, Lee. Uh, Evidence of the banding can be seen on winter leaves that uh, stay attached to the trees. They can also be seen, but are a little bit different on some of the more exotic cultivars like the European copper beech that you can see in the picture on the right. Um, there are a lot more um, cultivars and symptoms are more or less the same uh, on these different cultivars, but there, there are some differences. I'm in the process of putting together a, a, a slideshow of lots of different beach cultivars and uh, and symptoms uh, on those that I've collected from different people cooperating uh, in our region. Um, distorted leaf growth, leathery leaves. So just as a refresher, this is what a healthy American beach leaf looks like. Um, nice papery thin uh, leaf. Um, and this is what they look like when they're impacted with beech leaf disease. They're leathery, they're thicker, they're kind of rough, um, distorted. Uh, raised, sometimes raised banding. This is pretty much, these are two good, really good examples of what we typically see um, in terms of leaf uh, symptoms for beech leaf disease. There's a, a great difference between this and what you, for example, see on the right. Um, clear, but there are lookalikes. So these are two, these are the most reported lookalikes that we we uh, receive when we put the word out. You know, a lot of these detections, uh, the public was great on this. Um, you know, we there was uh, some. You know, we 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 reported the find. It was reported in some newspapers, and uh, we started getting a lot of calls about this. And some were were in fact beech leaf disease, but a lot were um, uh, lookalikes. And uh, but I, I just I think it was the the public played a, re a really um, really great role in report you know like giving us an idea of where to look um so that was that was a nice example of that uh so but anyway in terms of lookalikes aranium galls are made by an areophyid mite it's a little bit deceptive because this damage is intervenal it's between the veins but it's more raised bumpiness uh and you don't really see the banding when you look up from the uh the the you know, under understory looking up into the leaves. Um, and when you flip the leaf over, you see this kind of felty, these felty patches that uh, start out white and turn red with age. Um, so that's uh, a stark difference to beech leaf disease. Then the woolly beech aphid causes leaf distortion, causes discoloration, some chlorosis of leaf tissue. Um, the leaves typically curl up, but when you flip those curled leaves over and open them up, you see this like white flocculence that's uh, kind of like waxy stuff that's left by the aphid, or you may even see the aphids themselves in there um, sheltering as they feed. So those are two lookalikes. Here's another uh, much less reported um, lookalike, but it could be, you know, in certain locations, uh, it could be, you know, a more common lookalike, just, a, you know, anthracnose kind of pops up here and there. But beech anthracnose, and this is not a really seriously affected leaf. This is just a, a picture that I happened to take last year. But you can see the main difference here between beech leaf disease and beech anthracnose is that you have these, these dead portions of leaf tissue or, or lesions, necrotic lesions, so dead, dead leaf tissue with a kind of yellow halo around the lesion. So those are some of the, the lookalikes uh, that we see uh, with a beech leaf, uh, you know, people reporting beech leaf disease, it ends up being these some of these lookalikes. So the, the impacts impacts of beech leaf disease typically start in the understory. Um, they're most severe among beech regeneration and sprouts in the understory. And you know that that's what we've we've always heard, you know, tracking this disease from the lake states as it's kind of moved this way. But in Maine, we had pretty much top to bottom, and so on some sites, pretty much top to bottom uh, defoliation or impact to the canopy. And to just to point out the picture in the top right where you can see somebody's hand sort of pointing out, this is the first detection area of beech leaf disease. And this is almost a pure beech forest. It's, it's very heavily infested with beech bark disease. Um, and the, the homeowners said that, you know, last year when they tried to look out through the forest, uh, they couldn't see five 
five yards in front of them, whereas now they can see 200 yards clear through to the, the neighbor's field uh, through the woods. So it definitely has a, a major impact on canopy. Um, just these trees have a lot fewer leaves and, uh, and they're already stressed by beech bark disease. And I'm going to be very interested to see what this site looks like. We have a long term monitoring plot there, so we'll we'll have first hand knowledge of what what that looks like. So now to the big question, what causes beech uh, leaf disease? We don't know. Um, there's uh, some groups that are you know focusing on this pretty hard. Um, they've consistently found uh, a nematode, which is a microscopic roundworm associated with uh, symptoms of the disease. And this native is is native. This nematode is native to Japan. Um, what researchers are kind of leaning towards now is a more complex uh, pathosystem or you know life cycle or you know disease that you know causes symptoms um, that there probably are some microorganisms that are um, that are associated with this and I'm, I'm I did have a link to that presentation but or to that, that I did have a link to that uh, this must be the wrong version of my presentation but anyway there's a, there's several bacterial genera um, and, and a fungal genus that have been associated with symptomatic uh, leaf tissue. And so that story is kind of unfolding and uh, will be be of interest uh, you know, to see exactly how that. Uh, yeah, to see, see what, what those, you know, what that combination of environmental factors, microorganisms uh, and the nematode, how all those sort of interplay and cause the type of disease that we're seeing. So more questions than answers at this point. How does it spread? So how should we behave after we visit an area that has beech leaf disease? Do we, you know, do we do we have to, you know, wash our shoes and rubbing alcohol or, you know, what, what do we have to do to make sure that we don't spread this? We don't really know. We're trying to be as as um, as cleanly as possible when we when we exit a site to make sure that we're not spreading uh, the disease. But, you know, we really we're just really under informed as to to how this spreads. So there are a lot of theories. Um, some are being tested and you know we're, we'll, we'll hopefully learn more, but the, the progress is quite slow just because there's not a, a huge amount of people that are working on on this patho system. So you know the big question is you know why did the uh, symptoms develop so quickly and so drastically in in New England because they've been seeing the same kind of thing in Connecticut where you know as where the disease has developed over 5 years in Ohio where it starts in the understory and kills the understory and then moves slowly up into the overstory here in Maine and in, in Rhode Island and Connecticut, uh, you know, it's gone from zero symptoms one year to really advanced uh, symptoms in the next. And that's that's a big, big question. So <laughs> other things of interest are that, you know, nematodes have been found in asymptomatic trees um, in areas that are not impacted by beech leaf disease. And then nematodes have also been found in species other than beech and they have not been causing any symptoms. So these kind of things tell me that, you know, the it's is a more complex uh, system that we need to learn more about. Um, what we are doing about beech leaf disease at Maine Forest Service is we've set up uh, some long term monitoring plots. We set those up last year, and this is work that's been funded by the Forest Service in Durham and, and assisted by their pathologist. So we've been trying to get uh, one plot per county installed. The first year we got two in Waldo, that's where we first found um, the disease, and uh, we're going to try to set up some more plots this year uh, funding depending that's still uh, still kind of de developing but these plots are going to be surveys surveyed each year so we can kind of monitor how how things develop um, yeah this is an older version of the presentation I apologize for that um, so oak wilt is the next thing I want to talk about and th this is you know um, oak is on everybody's mind for a lot of reasons, and it's unfortunate oak, oak's a great tree, but it does have a lot of pests and some that are uh, fairly concerning. Um, but the good thing about oak wilt, if you can say there's a good thing about oak wilt, is that we don't have it in Maine yet. Um, it uh, we've definitely surveyed for it, uh, and we've uh, had some you know worrying uh, calls. Where we've gone to some place uh, where the you know somebody sent in pictures. It looks like oak wilt. But it hasn't ended up being oak wool, thank goodness, because it's a very complicated pathogen to manage. Um, 
Oak wilt and the causal fungus were first descri described in Wisconsin in the early 1940s. And um, since then, it's been, been spreading. And I'll show you a distribution map here in a second. Uh, it's a vascular wilt that's lethal to red oaks. Uh, it's a lot like Dutch elm disease because it's a vascular wilt. Um, it's fatal. And, but unlike Dutch elm disease, uh, oak wilt can kill a mature oak tree in a month, uh, which is pretty impressive for uh, for a fungus. Uh, also, like Dutch elm disease, the disease is vectored by a specific kind of beetle. And these beetles are attracted to sap, so they're attracted to wounded trees. Um, they are also attracted to the spore producing structure that uh, uh, that the, the fungus makes. And uh, the, the the fungus produces spores in a sticky kind of liquid that smells sort of fruity and yeasty. The beetles love that. They go there. They get covered with spores. My presentation has been hijacked here. The slides are advancing without me touching them. On here. I've frozen up here. Uh, should I unshare and then try to reshare? Try your arrow key. Yeah, nothing's nothing's working here. Yeah, why don't you? Uh, oh, it some, just moved. Some, something just happened. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll I'll try to do this again here. You got plenty of time, Aaron. So don't. Yeah. Run. That's that's a good thing. I'm not not rushed. Um. Yeah, so there's a lot of speculation as to the origin of oak wilt fungus. Um, current belief is that it, it it is not a foreign species. It, this pathosystem developed in North America, probably further south, um, maybe in Central America, possibly um, some kind of genetic shift in, in, in a, a fungal species that caused it to be really pathogenic. But uh, really not sure on the origins of that. OK, um, so this is the oak wilt distribution, and I kind of get scared when I look at this map because it looks a lot like the beech leaf disease map did, you know, four years ago. You think it's so really far away? The map is not showing, Aaron. The map is not showing, OK. See, I'm I'm seeing the map, but you guys aren't. Now are you seeing the map? Not yet. Okay. Huh, I'm at the office and everything. The, the connection should be really good. I'm gonna I just... was able to forward it myself down at the bottom. So maybe um Aaron, if you just want to let people know to move <laughs> forward. Um, like when you change I, slides, I would... we might be able to to scoot ahead ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Okay. don't do that. I, I, no, Aaron, I would unshare and then yeah, share again. I think I'm not. Right. Okay, never mind. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna try that. I think somebody probably inadvertently took control. Right. Um. I just I just took control. So can everybody see that now? I can see the map. OK, all right. So this is the map that worries me. Um, it's uh, like I said, looks like the beech leaf disease map of, of times, uh, you know, four years ago. And it just as a reminder that. You know, moving firewood, for example, um, or d disease to tree uh, material uh, can cause the map to change significantly and and th this is a very difficult one to manage and it's, it's a very devastating disease and we certainly have a lot of oaks in in Maine so it's something we want really want to detect as early as possible and do what we can to eradicate it so this is what we're dealing with in terms of basal area with oak in in Maine uh, you can see there's a lot in the, the southwest area and that's why we've focused on 
um, are we focused our surveys on that? And I have some survey slides a little bit later. But this is essentially the, the life cycle of oak wilt. So you've got these nitidulid beetles. They love sweet smelling liquids. They love, uh, you know, melons. They love uh, beer. They, in fact, they beer is one of the things that they use to to trap nitidulid beetles for different uh, studies. But anyway, they're attracted to the sweet smelling fungal pads that you can see here in number two. That form under the bark. They push. They create an enormous amount of pressure and actually can break open the bark. The beetles visit these. Uh, uh, spore pads, they get covered in spores and then they go to a wounded oak tree. Um, these are the spore pads. And they, you know, the spores come off their body, they germinate, they infect the vascular tissue of the oak tree, and then you start symptom development, which is discoloration of leaves, modeling of leaves, um, dieback, flagging of branches, um, staining of the xylem, which is a, sy a symptom that you also see in Dutch, Dutch elm disease. And eventually you get these pockets of dead oaks because also like Dutch elm disease, the, the, the vascular uh, wilt can travel um, through root grafts underground um, and affect neighboring trees that haven't been, in, haven't been visited by the beetles, but the, 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 the disease is transferred via the root systems from one tree to the next. And you can see these pretty clearly from the air, um, but uh, whenever there's an unexplained pocket of dying oaks, that's one thing that we certainly would like to know about. So just to, to summarize, leaf discoloration, staining of the xylem, bark cracks with sweet smelling fungal pads, branch or whole tree wilting symptoms. These are all, you know, hard to, um, maybe may things that people can't really pick up on. Um, unless you know you're really, really looking hard at your trees and really paying attention. But the one take home, one of the take homes of this presentation is that if you're seeing oaks dropping their leaves in summer, uh, that's a, a, an indication to call us so that we can come and check this out, uh, check the situation out and make sure that it's not actually oak wilt. So here are some different types of modeled leaves. So this again, the symptom is kind of hard to uh, um, you know, lean on just because it's it's very it's variable. Um, you know, these kind of look like fall senescing leaves in a way, but these pictures were taken in late July. Um, this is uh, these are some trees that are, have died from oak wilt. Um, and here's my other take home message. Uh, I would say, in, in the version of the presentation that I was supposed to have up, um, I have that crown symptoms can appear from May through September. So therefore, you know, don't prune your oaks from May to, to September. Um, and if you do end up wounding a tree or you have to make a pruning cut, this is one situation where I endorse sealing your wounds with uh, latex paint or uh, an actual uh, commercial wound sealer for, for pruning trees. <laughs> Uh, we did do oak wilt survey, and I, I alluded to that earlier. Um, and again, we focused on the southern western part of the state because of uh, that's where the highest basal area for oak oak wilt is, or sorry, the highest, highest basal area of oak. Um, there are some lookalikes that we encountered when we were doing the survey, and we did not find any oak wilt, of course, when we did the survey, but we did find a lot of these lookalikes, and these lookalikes have, you know, they, they mimic symptoms of flagging branches, wilting leaves, discolored leaves. And the first one I'll talk about is called bot canker. Um, it's a fungal canker that uh, typically really only impacts trees that are already under some kind of stress. You can see it on healthier trees, but usually not in, in large amounts. Um, so you get these. Uh, dead branch tips and you know any you know you, if you follow the symptom from you follow that uh, wilting dead tip symptom you come back you can see on this furthest right uh, picture uh, you can see that there is a canker and that canker has girdled the branch through its uh, pathogenic activity um, so that's bot canker somebody really is trying to get a hold of me here um so uh, oak wilt look like so oak anthracnose is another one. This is, uh, you know, oak anthracnose is a, is a leaf disease. It uh, causes ne necrotic uh, lesions on leaves. Leaves look can look tattered. Um, you can see whole branch symptoms. So this 
one on the on the far right. This is one of the close calls I considered from uh, two years ago when a woman called me from Sedgwick and said that her her trees were dying and and I went there and it was just a really severe case of of uh, oak anthracnose where the pretty much the whole crown was uh, involved and the, there were just so many uh, fungal lesions on the on the leaves that they were drying out and uh, the tree was actually in the process of dropping all of its leaves to, to refoliate because it was so heavily impacted by oak anthracnose. We did also see a lot of Kermi scale and um, you know these are scale insects that kind of they, they'll conglomerate around a branch and as they feed they will uh, girdle a branch and cause a dead tip. Um, so you know you follow back from the symptoms and you see this these like little tortoiseshell type uh, critters um, at the base of you know where the symptoms begin and that's Kermi scale a lookalike of oak wilt and then we've been seeing a lot of this uh, oak twig pruner um, and again I had I had edited this edited this this morning but uh, somehow the wrong presentation got popped up so anyway but again this is uh, oak twig pruner and the tips uh, Again, you have these these tips that are dead, uh, wilting, uh, because they've been hollowed out by oak twig pruner. So uh, that concludes my presentation. Uh, does anybody have any questions about beech leaf disease or oak wilt? And again, I'll, I'll just I just want to hammer home the two take home messages: we shouldn't be pruning oaks during the growing season, and. Um, if you do prune them or if there's been an injury to an oak, it's a good idea to seal that wound so that because that prevents uh, nitidulids from nitidulid beetles from uh, visiting visiting those wounds. And perhaps if there is oak wilt in the, in the area, you know, in introducing the, the disease to the trees. And then uh, if you do see oaks that are dropping their leaves during the growing season, uh, the insect and disease lab would surely like a call about that so we can follow up and, and make sure that we're not dealing with, you know, the first uh, incidents of, of oak wilt in Maine. So I'll take any questions anybody has at this time. All right, thank you, Aaron. Great job. I would also mention that oak wilt is another one that may be moved around with firewood. So yeah. again, another reason not to move firewood. And I see a hand up. Uh, KB. Did I understand it right? Even if we find it, there's no treatment? For oak wilt? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a vascular disease. And once once the disease once a fungus gets into a vascular system, it can it can really spread quickly. Just look like Dutch Dutch elm disease. You know, once you Except even more devastating, faster is what you said. Yeah, it kill it'll kill trees faster. But you know, once once you see a, a flagging branch of Dutch elm disease, you know you see that symptom up there. But the the fungus has really moved quite a bit in the vascular tissues by then. So even trying to you know get way ahead of it and pruning it seldom works. Um, it, but with oak wilt, typically you have even less time to react. It's just a very rapid and very virulent uh, pathogen uh, that. Uh, yeah, if you get introduction of the fungus via root grafts, the trees will go very fast. If you have an introduction from a beetle, let's say, up, you know, at the top of the crown, it could take two years to kill, uh, you know, the tree will be probably dead the following year, but it might not completely succumb that first year. It really depends upon the, the mode of transmission um, and, you know, the time of year as well. Yeah, oak wilt is one that we definitely want to try to keep out of Maine because once it gets here, then the me methods of trying to prevent it from spreading are pretty, pretty expensive and pretty heavy duty in terms of trenching and stuff like that. So definitely want to avoid this one. Absolutely. Other other questions for Aaron. I don't see any hands and I don't see anything in the chat. So I guess we'll move on. All right. Our, thank, thank you everybody. so much. Yeah, great job. Our next speaker is John Petrosky, who's manager of pesticide programs at the Board of Pesticides Control. And we know that lots of people have questions about how to treat for some of these things. So there's a lot of different rules that you got to follow. And John's going to talk about that. I'm working on it. Can't find my, oh, my power.
I'm having a hard time finding where my PowerPoint is when I hit share. You see that okay, Gary? There it is. You just need to open it up in presenter mode. I'm a little slow, but I'm getting there. So there you go. You, uh, yep. Thank you all very, very much uh, for allowing me to have a few minutes of your time. Uh, I just want to stress here this uh, that always as the Board of Pesticide should be a good resource for you. If you have questions or comments or need information, please reach out to the Board of Pesticides. Uh, I, this is our home page and a few things that it's uh, always want to point out is that there are useful sites that you can reach for us for like got past. You do have questions also. Here in the state of Maine, all pesticides have to be registered, which I'll get into a little bit more detail, but you can see on the left hand side of there. You can go here and check to make sure that the pesticides you are going to use are registered here in the state that is the law and then also i just want to point out that and i'm going to show a little bit more about that if you were looking for somebody to treat uh your property for whether it be brown tail moth or spongy moth or uh winter moth and so on you can go to our home page and find to how to hire companies and just going to give you a little um I'll go over that a little bit more detail the thing I, I really want to stress, which uh, what is a pesticide? And many people actually, I'm not sure, get this a little bit confused, but it is any substance or mixture of substances that are intended for killing, preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating any pest. Uh, and it's also, by the way, any plant regulator, defoliant, or desiccant. Pesticide is not a fertilizer or nutrient unless you're going getting something like feed and weed. When that does have pesticides in it. It does not include beneficial organisms and it's not include traps or mechanical means. So this is important to know. So we do get a lot of questions here uh, about who can I get to treat for emerald ash borer or winter moth or spongy moth and so on. So it has to be a commercial applicator. It has to be a spray contracting firm. They do definitely have to use pesticide products registered here in the state of Maine. And in this particular case, for those up here, it's normally the site would be outdoor ornamental. So that particular information would have to be on the label. In outdoor ornamentals includes commercial applications using or supervising the use of pesticides to control pests and the maintenance and production of outdoor ornamental trees such as oak or ash, shrubs and flowers. So how do I do it? For, I can go to our homepage for the Board of Pesticide Control. Look where it says uh, pesticide. Uh, and you look, see where you uh, for hire companies for hire. And again, you go down to the category. And in this particular case, you would type 3A, which is outdoor ornamental. And something like this would come up first. Uh, so you can download it and scroll it and uh, get it. It can also help you. If you do need help with this, you can also contact us. We're more than happy to help you. If you just want it by county or, or local, close towns close to you. Very something very, very important for all of us to understand, especially when you're going to be using pesticides. About spraying near water. So there is a chapter in our rules, chapter 29 for standards for, for water quality protection. Please, if you need more information on this, we are finding pesticides in our surface waters and in our ground waters. So again, there are many rules and regulations. There's also a lot of information, very, very important about spraying pesticides on the label itself. So please also pay attention very, very close to the weather. For example, it's gonna rain, did it rain last night? How soggy is the ground? You may wanna uh, look at the label to make sure whether or not you could use that product. So here at the Board of Pesticides, we get a lot of questions uh, calling in. And so I'm just gonna go over some of them important ones here. 
Can you treat your own property? Yes, that would be for sure. However, I really want to stress to you, please, please do your research. ID the pest. What is that pest that you got? I think it was um, Tom a little bit earlier talked about that people didn't uh, ID the pest correctly, which will affect what kind of management options you are going to use uh, and to treat that pest. So again, please ID the pest. I really truly stress um, reaching out. If you don't know exactly what that pest is and are certain, please reach out to the main forest service. They're an excellent, excellent resource to help you identify the pest that you have. And use IPM, in which I'm going to go into much more detail in just a few minutes here, but please remember IPM should be first, foremost on your mind. Read that label. So it is the law. You have to follow everything that is on the label. It is the law, and you can be fined uh, for not following the label. On that label, you're going to find what personal protective equipment you should be wearing. The site, can I actually use it? on this oak tree or can I use it uh, on turf or someone like that? It's extremely important that you understand that the site has to be a match up to the label that your uh, the pesticide product you're gonna be using. It doesn't have to say on the label that I'm gonna be treating for brown tail moth because you may find many products that you can use based on the site, but it may not list the pests such as brown tail moth. Always Focus on the environmental hazards, especially when it comes to water, and then sensitive areas. And that would, it could include you know, people, uh, buildings, and so on. Board of Pesticide Control recommends hiring a commercial applicator to be safe. Pesticides, remember, pesticides product always must be registered here in, this, in the state of Maine. So I'm going to a little more detail in a second. Can you treat your neighbor's property? So we do get this on a kind of a regular basis here. People who are in a neighborhood, they're going to be treating for, in this particular case, brown tail moth. Uh, they want to go over to their neighbor's property because they, you know, understand how those fibers float around. The answer is absolutely not. You cannot go treat your neighbor's property. You would need a commercial license to do that and then your own company or be working for another company. So. Can you treat your neighbor's property? Can you go on to uh, town land or something like that and treat? Absolutely not. What type of license then would I need if I wanted to do these treatments? It would be a commercial, uh, which could include a commercial master applicator or commercial operator applicator. If you were starting your own company, then you would have to have a commercial master applicator. Again, in this particular case, you would have to be have the category uh, that you studied outdoor ornamental. And remember, you do have to have you definitely would have to have insurance to cover in case there was any uh, problems with your applications. So what products work? You get this quite frequently as well. So the Board of Pesticide Control cannot recommend products. It would be a conflict of interest. Um, since we also regulate the pesticides here that you are used in the state of Maine. We can discuss active ingredients, so which is a very important to know what active ingredients uh, and what the implications are of different active ingredients that you might use. But again, go back to doing your research. Um, it is very important again to know what the issue is and what products you should be looking at to use. And as I said earlier, the main forest service is such an excellent resource when it comes to what type of treatment, what type of management options do I have? The Board of Pesticide also has a toxicologist on our staff. Her name is Pam Breyer. She is absolutely fabulous. If you need something, if you're trying to use a product and you're concerned about safety issues and so on, please reach out to Pam or myself. We will get the information for you just to make sure you can make an educated decision on what products you should be using. 
Do the products need to be registered here in the state of Maine? Absolutely, yes. And that would include uh, the EPA registered products, but also 24B products that uh, do not have to be registered with the EPA. And that can include different oils and other uh, organic materials. But again, uh, please be very careful. Do your research. Make sure you can see a lot of different things on social media that certain oils and other uh, products may, uh, they would say work. But again, the um, if it's registered with the EPA, then there's been a lot of studies done on the on toxicity of it as well as the efficacy of it. But those are not being done with 24B products. So again, buyer beware, but be very, very careful uh, that you do your research and make sure what you're doing will not be harmful. You can reach out to the Board of Pesticide Products and go to our website if you have a particular product that you want to use. Uh, but again, you look at it. And if it's not on our website or you go to our product registration on our website and look it up. And if it's not there, it's not registered here in the state of Maine. Or you can also call us. We would look it up for you. Remember, you should not be using. It's against the law to be using products here in the state of Maine that are not registered. And one of the products we uh, people are using. Uh, you can buy them online. And that is ACE caps. Uh, we get a lot of calls about ACE caps recently. And again, those are not registered in the state of Maine. If you go to the company ACE caps and try to buy it, you will not be able to buy it. However, there are other um, online areas and websites that you can buy and have them shipped in the state of Maine. But I just want to warn everybody they have not registered here in the state. Are they safe? Great question. Are the products that you want to use safe? Risk. All pesticides have risk. And it's really based on the toxicity times exposure. What that means is I can buy a pesticide product that could be highly toxic. But if I'm wearing the correct personal protective equipment, if I'm doing it correctly, following the label, my risk may be down. However, I could be using a low toxicity product but I don't wear my personal protective equipment. I don't wash up after I've used it and so on, then my risk could be higher. Signal words, all the pesticides have a signal word on them, the EPA registered. Caution, you will see either the word caution, warning, or danger. Caution means that it is slightly toxic. Warning means that it is moderately toxic and danger is highly toxic. So again, very, really important to know, and you want to choose that caution is if all if it's possible to use um, pesticide products that are, have the word caution because they are slightly toxic. However, you still always have to take precautions. Please make sure you wear the purse protective equipment and use it according to the label. Weather. Uh, today, we're seeing a lot of issues about weather. We see companies that are spraying and, uh, and homeowners and so on that are spraying when it rained the night before or it rained that morning or it's going to rain tomorrow or tonight. Again, uh, we have uh, acted these, some of these active ingredients, pesticides in our groundwater and in our surface water, and it is very, very important to follow the weather. Please again, remember it's so important. All pesticides have risk, all of them, whether it's caution, warning, or danger, 25B products, whatever you see, 24B products, excuse me, all pesticides have risk. And it really depends on the rates that you're using them and are you following the PPE and so on. So please be very careful. And finally, more is not better. So I understand, <clears throat> especially when it comes to concerns such as ticks or poison ivy or a brown tail moth. Remember, follow the label, there are rates on there and so on. More is not better, it's not going to help you. Also I want to stress right now, protect our bees and other pollinators. If you see on the lower right hand corner, 
you see that B on the label, you're going to take extra special precautions. So we don't want you to apply toxic pesticides if the crop is blooming or if about to bloom or if plants are blooming in nearby areas. It's very important. If you have weeds that are in bloom right now around where you're going to be making treatments, get rid of them, mow them down, reduce drift. What does that mean? You in the state of Maine, you can spray pesticides between two and 15 miles per hour, but we really truly recommend spray between two and 10 miles per hour most. Again, if you have the opportunity to apply early or late when the pollinators are not foraging, but if you do see that be on get on that label, please take extra special precautions. Finally, IPM. So I just recently got a call as well about, you know, they want to make a treatment on a pest. I asked them how did they identify it? They didn't really know. They didn't really know if they exactly what that pest was. It is so important to know identification and know what that pest is. And then how bad is that pest? You know, do you have a few uh, or is it completely taking over your lawn or your trees and so on? And maybe that risk uh, is not is not that great about that particular pest. So please look at the threshold. How really bad is the particular situation that you have? And then make a really sound decision. And again, there are biological controls. There are insects, biological insects out there that can maybe take care of the issue. Mechanical control, and you can use those. And cultural control first, maybe before you decide to use chemical control. So again, uh, please try to use chemical control as your last option. So again, um, please use IPM. It's really the right thing to do. And that is, concludes my presentation. And I want to thank you all very, very much for allowing me and I'll be happy to take any questions you have. So. All right, thank you, John. Great job. Um, just want to mention that it's 25B products. You got 24, I know, I, you know, 24C I, I, and 25B I, mixed up, but it's sorry, 25B you know, or minimum risk and 24C is special local needs. Sorry about that, you're absolutely right. Anybody have questions for John or uh, questions that haven't been answered from any of the speakers? We do have a few more minutes here before noontime. You can either put it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and. Well, I, I want to thank you all for joining in today. I think that it was a great bunch of presentations that brings you up to date to all the latest potential things that are out there that are threatening our forests especially. And hopefully you've learned a lot that you can take back with you to, to do a, a good job of either helping us monitor for them, slowing their spread, or in maybe some instances actually controlling them. Uh, Amy Emery did put the link to the Microsoft Forms quiz that's online that you can take. And again, if you uh, are not able to get to the chat, you can email foresthealth at maine.gov and that way you can get information about how you can get on to the, the quiz and be able to take that so that you can get credits for your pesticide applicator license or for your forestry license. 